It's the Bradfield Weather Podcast, underwritten by Action Carpet and Floor Covering of Simsbury. Voted first runner-up five straight years in Hartford Magazine's Best Of survey. I'm Dan Lavallo. He is meteorologist Brad Field. We are putting this podcast together on September 10th. And, Brad, you talk about timing. This is actually the official halfway mark, September 10th, of the hurricane season. Yeah, today is the actual uh, climax day, Dan, in terms of uh, climatological uh, quantity of storms. And then we start to uh, diminish uh, as we head toward uh, later in September and October. But uh, all sorts of action in the tropical Atlantic, nothing immediately threatening, though, to anyone. But, however, that could change early next week. And the place that I'm concerned for is Bermuda. Really? How come? Well, there are several systems, Dan. The first one we're looking at is called Paulette, and uh, she is located at 20.9 north, 49.0 west, and about 1,250 miles to the southeast of Bermuda. The uh, storm right now is moving to the west-northwest at 10 miles per hour, Maximum sustained winds are 60 miles per hour, but the storm is forecast to strengthen over the weekend, and it could be right on top of Bermuda as a hurricane on Monday night, I'd say, uh, September 14th. So we're concerned uh, for Bermuda with Paulette heading in that direction. There are a lot of little uh, just disturbances uh, off the southeast coast of the United States. The one I am most concerned with right now is kind of a disorganized area of showers and storms. It's about 200 miles to the east of the Bahamas, and it's slowly working its way off to the west and northwest. Uh, National Hurricane Center says there's about a 30% chance that this could develop into something in the eastern Gulf of Mexico early next week, so you might want to monitor that uh, if you have any friends or family in the uh, panhandle of Florida or uh, Mississippi or Alabama or Louisiana, there might be something brewing for the early part of next week. And again, Dan, folks can go to bradfieldweather.com, and you provided the link to the National Hurricane Center. So if you go to bradfieldweather.com, you can get your daily forecast, you can get the latest podcast. You can get radar tracking. Uh, you can get uh, information from Eversource and United uh, Illuminating uh, regarding uh, power conditions. You can get uh, data from the uh, Severe Storms Forecast Center, the Prediction Center, and, of course, the link to the National Hurricane Center. So you can always stay up with the latest on Paulette heading toward Bermuda and this disturbance uh, east of the Bahamas kind of drifting probably right across Florida and perhaps develop into something in the eastern Gulf of Mexico. You know, Brad, to give our audience an idea of how active the hurricane season has been, there are just four more names left this season, Sally, Teddy, Vicky, and Wilfred. After that, we move to the Greek alphabet for only the second time (laughs) in history. I know, Dan. It has been, you know, all you have to say is it's 2020. (laughs) <laughs> um, it, 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 yeah, it seems like everything that uh, can possibly go wrong is going wrong this year. And, uh, you know, it just seems like it's par for the course. But uh, it, it, it seems to me, Dan, today being the peak day of the hurricane season, that we are certainly going to achieve those four more names and uh, likely a few more. So uh, it does appear, if I had to play odds on it, that we are going to be going with the Greek alphabet before you know it. Well, this weather's been interesting, and as you said, it's 2020. That's all you need to say. Look at Denver. Over the last week, one day the temperature was hot as blazes. The next day they were getting a snowstorm. What's going on, I guess, is my question. No, it's. Uh, I, I was looking at that, Dan. It's just incredible. Uh, if we go back um, almost a week, if we go back to last Friday, September 4th, It got to 91 in Denver. Uh, This is the city now. Um, Over the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, it was, listen to this, 101 and 97 on Saturday and Sunday. On Monday, Labor Day, it was 93. 
So they had a four-day heat wave, and as you say, it was hot as blazes. And then listen to this. 6 p.m. on Labor Day in Denver, it's 92. But by daybreak, it's in the mid-30s. There was a 55-degree temperature drop overnight uh, during uh, Labor Day night. On Tuesday, an inch of snow accumulated in the city of Denver. After a four-day heat wave, just crazy, six to eight inches in the mountains near Denver, uh, the high was 43, the low 31. So the high on Tuesday was 43 after that 93 on Labor Day. And then just yesterday being 42 in Denver, off a morning low of 31 and another trace of snow. Uh, I looked at some of the accumulations of snow. The mountains near Denver had six to eight inches of accumulation. Same thing in the mountains near Colorado Springs. Uh, There was an inch or two around Grand Junction and a place off to the uh, southwest of Colorado Springs, uh, kind of in the mountains, was called, is called Turquoise Lake. They recorded 15.5 inches of snow. So, again, chalk it up to 2020, just some crazy, crazy things happening. And uh, that's, that's only one of many. I've got more for you. The Bradfield Weather Podcast is underwritten by Action Carpet and Floor Covering of Simsbury. I want to take a moment to talk about Action Carpet and Floor Covering of Simsbury, underwriters of the Bradfield Weather Podcast. Voted first runner-up five straight years in Hartford Magazine's Best of Survey. Action Carpet and Floor Covering is a full-service, family-run floor company offering everything from brand-name floor covering products to professional installation and cleaning services. You know, since 1993, Action Carpet and Floor Covering has served both residential and commercial customers throughout Connecticut and beyond. For Action Carpet and Floor Covering, no job is too small. Action Carpet and Floor Covering values all of its customers regardless of the size of the project. Action Carpet and Floor Covering was founded in 1993 by Kevin Blake, and it has always been the mission of Action Carpet and Floor Covering to understand customers' individual flooring needs and to help them realize all of their options. Here's what you need to know about Action Carpet and Floor Covering. Action Carpet and Floor Covering aims to assist in making an informed flooring purchase that will suit a customer's budget requirements and lifestyles. Action Carpet and Floor Covering, building relationships of trust and comfort. Call Action Carpet and Floor Covering today at 860-651-8406, 860-651-8406, or go online, action-carpet.com. That's action Carpet. Well, you know, like real estate, it's all about location, location, location. But uh, when it comes to weather extremes, what happened in Denver over the last week, is that unusual even for Colorado despite its location? Yeah, I was looking at that too, Dan. Uh, They've had some prolific temperature uh, swings uh, over a one-day period, a two-day period, a three-day period. I think the uh, biggest swing I saw was over a three-day period, an 81-degree change in temperature. Uh, they've got a, a lot of uh, a lot of potential there because of their elevation. A lot of potential to get cold quickly uh, when some of the the cold air comes down from the Canada Rockies and then moves straight from uh, north to south down into the Colorado area. But yes, you know, the funny thing about that is this is not going to last in Denver. They had the, 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 the cold and the snow. It looks as though a tremendous ridge is going to form in the west again, and it's going to become hot again out there. So uh, it, it's crazy. It's functional of the jet stream. Yes, indeed, there was a little bit of a dip in the, in the jet that got down into that area and brought that huge change in temperature, but uh, the ridge is going to pump right back up. 
And I'd say by the middle of next week, it's just going to be plain hot out there again. Uh, we are going to be more in a northwesterly flow here in Connecticut, so it's going to be uh, quite a lot different. One thing I noticed about wavelengths um, with, with upper-level disturbances, and what I mean by that is the distance between where the center of a ridge is and the center of a trough is, think of kind of a you know, downward motion in the atmosphere under a ridge, so that would uh, produce a, a, a compression would produce the absence of cloud cover. Compression can produce heat. So uh, under the ridge, think of it as hot and dry. And in the trough, you've got cool air uh, pooling in, in the trough. So uh, it looks as though the wavelength that I'm speaking of, I've noticed over my career that when Denver gets really hot, we usually get really cool when compared to average. And the reverse is true. Um, when Denver is really cold, we are usually quite warm. And, you know, it hasn't been exceptionally so over the last couple of days, but it's been warm with respect to average. It certainly hasn't been cooler than average. But next week, I think when that ridge starts to build over Denver, it's going to turn much, much cooler here. And we're using the terms next week in the forecast autumnal. Uh, I put that in there uh, during the day on Monday for sure, Tuesday for sure, Wednesday for sure. And, you know, Tuesday night into Wednesday morning next week, Dan, somebody in Connecticut, I don't think it's going to be you in Torrington. I think you got to get out of an urban area. you got to go up to maybe Goshen or, or Colebrook or something. Someone is going to be 39, 38 on Wednesday morning. So getting to that time of year. Brad, we'll get to our On the Weather Map segment in just a moment, but you mentioned there's so much going on on the weather map, including out west with these fires. What's happening? Crazy. Uh, I saw it described in a newspaper out of San Francisco as a, quote, nuclear winter, unquote, for the Bay Area. The wildfires are blotting out the sun. Hours after sunrise yesterday, Dan, cars were driving around with their headlights on. Office towers were illuminated as if it were the middle of the night. Uh, we have 20 fires burning across California. Uh, I saw a quote from a meteorologist named Craig Shoemaker. He's with the National Weather Service in Sacramento. He said the smoke from these wildfires has risen to a level of 40,000 feet in the atmosphere. So, you know, when you're up in a plane, you're flying at about 35,000 feet. And if you've ever noticed uh, what the temperature is out, outside your window, it can be even in the middle of the summer, and it can be way below zero up at that level, uh, that, that altitude. It's uh, extremely cold, and what's happening is the huge cloud is turning to ash and ice up there, and then you've got the uh, the sun trying to beam through the ash and being refracted by the ice crystals and so forth. So you're getting these fiery orange skies and red skies, and fire, of course, makes weather of its own because of the heat. You've got rising columns of air, uh, so instead of the skies being clear, as they should have been over San Francisco yesterday, they were obscured with smoke. Uh, the winds are, uh, again, the fire makes its own weather. The heat causes ex rising columns of air as the heat rises. And, and uh, the, the wind pattern now is such that it's pushing the smoke out into the Pacific Ocean. But this meteorologist, Shoemaker, that I was talking about from the San Francisco National Weather Service, is cautioning when the winds reverse, this old smoke is going to come right back. And, of course, you know, these poor folks out there breathing in this, uh, this smoke, uh, obviously not very good for your health either. Uh, and they're, they're saying that, I believe it was 2.9 million acres have already burned. And they, uh, for, for, for California, they expect the peak, uh, a usual peak of the dry season and the fire season to be October and November. 
So they haven't even gotten into the months where they're, they're most noted for these wildfires, and they've already broken a record with 2.9 million acres burned. Um, I believe the previous record, and I don't know what year that was, it was fairly recently, though, was 1.9 million acres. So it's just been uh, awful out, out west, too. And it's not just California. It's many of the states out west have these wildfires burning. I saw one as far east as West Texas. So uh, there, there's uh, just been some very dry conditions out that way too, and um, a lot of these um, a lot of these fires are directly attributed to lightning strikes. So lightning hits, um, you know, uh, dry tinder. And, and and lights it on fire. So um, it, I, I also heard that there was, a, a, I guess, a baby reveal party or something that went awry and started a wildfire, too. But most of them are naturally caused by lightning. It's it, like you said, it's uh, 2020. Now, as we put this podcast, yeah, yeah I mean, that's the way it go, it's gone. But as we put this podcast, yeah. As we put this podcast together on Thursday, September 10th, uh, let's take a look at on the weather map and how it's going to affect our region of the country. All right, Dan, it's, uh, we're going to get a little bit of rain today and a little more rain on Sunday. And this is good news because the stats out of Bradley uh, show that we've only had, uh, here we are, uh, what, almost uh, three quarters of the way through the year, We've only had 21.62 inches of rain recorded at the airport, whereas normally by September 10th, there's 31.25 inches of rain. I did a little calculation. We are running a rainfall deficit of 31%. So in other words, for every uh, three inches of rain we normally get, we've only had two. So it's been, uh, it's been a dry year. We are definitely short in the rain department. But uh, on the weather map, there is a little bit of hope for some rain today and a little bit of hope for some rain on Sunday. It's warm and it's muggy out there right now, but we've got a cold front approaching from western New York. Uh, It appears to me that this will pass across southern New England this evening, preceded and accompanied by showers and some uh, garden-variety thunderstorms. You might hear rumbles of thunder, flashes of lightning, but I do not think it'll be anything severe. But uh, rainfall could be pretty good, so we could get a little bit of a moderate rain out of this, especially during the afternoon in those heavier thunder showers and early this evening. Now, by daybreak tomorrow, Friday, September 11th, we'll have high pressure over Michigan, much, much drier conditions here. So you'll notice the humidity will have dropped off significantly. Uh, the temperatures will be r- lovely tomorrow with readings in the 70s, uh, nice uh, clear blue skies out there. By daybreak Saturday, the high pressure system should be located right over in New Hampshire. Now, Sunday morning, weak high pressure will be hanging on off Boston, and we will have a reinforcing coal front approaching from the eastern Great Lakes. So uh, as as Cam Newton and the Patriots make their – Uh, debut in Foxborough this year. It looks like there might be some rain showers around on Sunday afternoon and Sunday evening. By Monday, we will see a cold front sweeping offshore, breezy with an autumnal feel in the air. I mean, behind the first cold front, where you're going to notice the humidity go down and you're going to notice the temperature go down. That starts as early as tomorrow. But by the time Monday rolls around and that second cold front's gone by, you're going to say, oh, my goodness, here comes winter, uh, because it's going to feel uh, sort of autumnal out there. Big high over the upper Great Lakes on Monday morning. Uh, that high should be near Buffalo by the time Tuesday morning rolls around. Still a north wind continues here in Connecticut. Remember, we're clockwise around high pressure, so if that thing's over Buffalo, northerly wind here, and by Wednesday morning, that high is going to be right over us, uh, right over Connecticut and western Massachusetts. So the combination of clear sky, no wind at all, 
is going to produce maximum radiational cooling overnight. Hence, I think everyone will be down in the 40s on Wednesday morning. Even the big cities along the shoreline like Bridgeport and Norwalk and New Haven, everybody will be down in the 40s. And as I said, those places up your way, Dan, and just to the north, up toward Colebrook and Goshen and so forth, I think some upper 30s are going to show up on Wednesday morning. Okay, Mr. Patriots fan, you mentioned your team, the Patriots, and Cam Newton. Uh, What do you make of these stories that this could be Bill Belichick's last year? Oh, my goodness, I hadn't heard those stories. I mean, uh, there are some stories making the rounds and he won't comment yeah. on it. he won't comment on it, but uh, there are some stories making the rounds to that effect. Well, he has been uh, a tremendous coach. There's no doubt about it. But uh, as as we all know, uh, you know, you get a little bit older and you start to slow down. And uh, I personally will will watch when there's um, tornado warnings up, and I see. Uh, Ryan is on NBC, and Bruce is on CBS, and Rachel is on Fox, and either Gil or Joe is on uh, on uh, Channel 8 down in New Haven, ABC. I think, oh my goodness, I am so glad I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I un- so I understand. I, I just think that um, I just think that that uh, Coach Belichick has been a wonderful coach, and and. Um, you know, I I would applaud whatever decision he makes. Um, you know, he's given he's given everything uh, to the Patriots organization for 20 years, and uh, be interesting to see how he does this year. And it will also be interesting to see how Mr. Brady does down in Tampa. Yeah, no question about that. You know, speaking of Belichick, he's getting rave reviews for that sandwich shop commercial that he did, and I don't know if you I don't know if you're aware of this, but that that commercial was actually filmed in downtown Brantford. Brantford. Yes. No, I did I did not know that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I I'm going to tell you that is that is the greatest commercial, and if if um, if there's somebody out there that hasn't happened to see it yet. Uh, Bill Belichick is walking down the sidewalk and he encounters this guy who's got some other fast food in his hand. And uh, it, Bella, he goes, Bill Belichick? And Belichick looks at that, that other fast food and he goes, really? <laughs> really? And he says, oh, I should have gotten a foot long, you know, at this other sandwich shop. And then, then Belichick's wearing his sweatshirt with the sleeves hacked off like he always does. He takes out the scissors and he cuts the the sleeves off this guy's suit and he goes, now you look much better too. (laughs) Um, It actually, it actually showed a lot of personality. And I, and I understand, you know, being a Patriots fan my, my whole life. And, you know, I did grow up in a Sonnet, Massachusetts, which is virtually in the shadow of Foxborough. So I was a Patriots fan through the thin years in the seventies and eighties. And, um, so I've been a, basically a fan my my entire life, but um, you know it's it's uh, it's been a it's been an awesome career, and, and uh, you know hopefully hopefully uh, we can get some fans in the stands, Dan. Um, you know I think the Governor Baker has said that there will be nobody attending in the month of September, but I do understand that fans are going to be allowed in Dallas something like 22% capacity is what I heard last. And same deal at Arrowhead in Kansas City. So there will be some stadiums that have fans in it, but for now, Foxborough will not. It's going to be weird, that's for sure. And uh, I think that's the perfect segue for our crystal ball segment, not talking about NFL predictions, but look into your crystal ball. (laughs) Is where We still have two-thirds of the month of September left. Look into your crystal ball. What does it look like? All right, well, we'll take it through the rest of the month then, Dan. We'll talk about the next, uh, you know, the next week in my uh, short-term forecast and then weeks uh, three and four here in the uh, crystal ball segment. So we'll, we'll start in the middle of next week. It looks like it's going to be cool through the north-central United States, and that will include New England and the mid-Atlantic. As we have a ridge, a uh, trough, and a slight east coast ridge, but, that is going to get uh, trumped and quashed down by uh, this huge ridge that's going to be developing through the Rockies of not only the United States, but the Rockies of Western Canada as well. 
such that by next weekend, so we're talking Saturday the 19th and Sunday the 20th, that huge ridge will start in the United States Rockies and push all the way up through western sections of Canada. So that's going to direct our wind flow from northwest Canada down across uh, central Canada, the Hudson Bay area, and then move uh, the coolish air down into uh, eastern Canada, southeastern Canada, and the northeastern part of the United States. So it looks like that huge ridge will be in the Rockies and a trough in the east centered over eastern Canada and, uh, say, upstate New York. So that's going to keep it, uh, I think, cool here. For As far as your normals go, Dan, we're always talking about how we're losing a couple minutes of daylight on the end of the day. We're losing a couple of minutes of daylight in the morning. So as we have less sunlight to heat the earth, uh, every day seemingly gets cooler and cooler. Today being um, Thursday, September 10th, the normal high at Bradley today is 77, and the normal low at Bradley is 55. But as we head toward the middle of next week, just a week from now, uh, we're talking a daytime high of 74 and a nighttime low of 52. So the, the temperature is going down fast. The average temperature is going to go down uh, three degrees just in this uh, next week alone. So those are the normals, and I'm projecting temperatures to be cooler than the normals. So we're, we're looking at, uh, I think, Tuesday and Wednesday of next week, temperatures are going to have a hard time getting out of the 60s for the high temperature reading. So there will definitely be the, uh, the feel of fall. One more thing I want to put in the back of your head on this crystal ball segment, Dan. I was looking at the various computer models, you know, starting out around 10 days out. There may be a hurricane in the vicinity of Cuba and the Florida Keys by, uh, say, 10 days out from now. So that would be maybe early in the week of Monday, September 21st, maybe early that week. That's depicted by the uh, European computer model just north of Cuba and, uh, you know, moving toward the Florida Keys. So just something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, these are all these waves coming off the coast of Africa and moving from uh, east to west across the tropical Atlantic. So they picked up on something and projecting 10 days out, all of a sudden there's a hurricane there. So, uh, you know, something to keep our eyes on. Now, you mentioned cooler than normal temperatures next week. What does that mean for the fall foliage season around here? Well, there's a, there's a lot of factors that go into it, Dan, but the most important factor is the quantity of daylight. So sometimes no matter what the weather, no matter what the weather, the quantity of daylight is the thing that matters the most. So uh, the chlorophyll in the leaves is what makes them green and the sunlight is what keeps the chlorophyll alive when the the chlorophyll is actually the food so when when the when the um when the when the daylight diminishes and the chlorophyll starts to die out the 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 tree reveals its real colors the reds the yellows the oranges and so forth but there's no food anymore <laughs> So then the leaves and leaves start to die. So the, the, the most important factor is the amount of daylight. So no matter what the weather, you're going to have this cycle of the trees going from green to the reds and yellows and oranges and then uh, to, you know, the brown dead leaves that fall off and everyone has to rake. So uh, that's one factor. Uh, the other factor is the amount of um, – the amount of moisture in the soil. So it's been a really dry uh, summer. June was very dry. July was very dry. August has been very dry or was very dry. So uh, it looks like a little bit of a change is occurring as we might get some more rain today and we might get some more rain on Sunday. So I guess my answer is, Dan, we're going to have to see. Um, we, we, you, you start with a baseline of this normally happens anyway, just based on daylight shrinking when you head into the fall and the chlorophyll dying. But what combination is going to cause the spectacular color? 
we've had a dry summer. There's no question about it. So if all of a sudden the leaves are beautiful this year, we'll know, well, hey, maybe you need a dry summer leading up to the, the, the autumn. So um, I really don't know the answer to how spectacular it will be this year, but um, we'll have some good clues. I mean, if all of a sudden – it's drab and dingy and and you'll say, well, we need more rain in the summertime than we had, but um, it'll be interesting to see, but we will have those autumnal temperatures starting next week uh, with uh, readings in the sixties, Tuesday and Wednesday and overnight lows, mostly in the forties. But as I said, don't be shocked to see some upper thirties. So like that, commercial which had that great line tastes great less filling which you're telling us is less chlorophyll more colorful <laughs> i guess so <laughs> i uh i i I'm, you know what dan i will uh i will restudy this a little <laughs> bit um and no and and you know and look at what the the factors are and 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 weight them uh i i know that the just the shrinkage of daylight and the lessening of daylight is the primary factor. But it will be interesting to see, uh, are cooler than normal temperatures better? Do they, accelerate the, um, do they accelerate the demise of the chlorophyll more and enhance the color more? Is it better to have dry soil? Is it better to have wet soil? We can, uh, we can weight this with various percentages and um, maybe revisit this topic next week. Well, as you undertake your study of less chlorophyll, more colorful, do it while having some taste great, less filling, all right? <laughs> <laughs> now, now, that I can do. <laughs> that I can do, Dan. Well, I probably do that. I probably do that too well as, uh, you know, my clothes are fitting tighter and tighter. <laughs> well, well, that said, let's put a wrap on the podcast uh, by giving us the immediate forecast. And again, we're putting this together on Thursday, September 10th. All right, Dan, for the remainder of this afternoon and this evening, it's going to be warm and muggy out there, 76 to 82 degrees. Uh, again, that's uh, within the realm of what's normal, 77 being normal, but it's going to feel uncomfortable because of the humidity. So 76 to 82 out there uh, this afternoon, showers and thunderstorms. There'll be some late night clearing overnight with the temperature dropping to near 60. Friday, mostly sunny, temperatures in the 70s. Clear at night, 48 to 54. Saturday looks mostly sunny, 70 to 75, partly cloudy Saturday night, a hint of uh, something coming, temperatures in the 50s. What is coming is a cloudy sky with a chance of showers on Sunday, temperatures in the 70s, so that's prefrontal. It's up into the 70s, a little bit on the muggy side. But then Monday, we're on the back side of the front. We are cold air advecting. Uh, mixed clouds and sun temperatures in the 70s, probably a little bit on the breezy side, too. Uh, for Tuesday, it's mostly sunny, 66 to 72. It's in the 40s Tuesday night, some upper 30s showing up in the cold spots of northwestern Connecticut. And then Wednesday looks sparkling, sunny, 66 to 72 for the high temperature reading. And uh, this is my prediction. I think you can kiss the 90-degree days goodbye for the rest of this year. But it was a very hot summer, of course, breaking the record established back in 1983 with 38 90-degree days or higher. This year, we achieved that 39 times. But I think we're done with uh, temperatures of 90 or higher. Okay. Well, Brad, uh, at this point in the podca podcast, we always thank our first responders. Uh, a big thank you to all of those who put their lives on the line every day for us, for our safety, and to our podcast audience, and to you and Sandy and your family. Have a great weekend. Dan, thank you to the, uh, to the heroes who are uh, dealing with the pandemic, and to the heroes that uh, tomorrow... 19 years ago, uh, ran into buildings that were struck by the planes on 9-11-2001. Uh, uh, 19 years ago, Dan, but I remember it as if it was yesterday almost. I do, too. Well said. Thanks, my friend. 
Thank you, Dan. Have a good weekend. You too. The Bradfield Weather Podcast, underwritten by Action Carpet and Floor Covering of Simsbury, voted first runner-up five straight years in Hartford Magazine's Best of Survey.